Hello and welcome to COVID-19, the orthopedic response. It's a production of DocSF and UCSF, and I'm your host, Shauna Butler. And I am so pleased that the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has joined us in um, being a global convener to help address and rapidly respond to the dramatic changes that we're all experiencing as healthcare providers, as patients, as communities in these um, interesting and challenging times. And so we're grateful to have a global audience joining us. And today I'm so thrilled to have Jamie Cayouet. Um, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He practices at the um, Hogue Orthopedic Institute. And you have a private practice, right, as well in Newport, in Newport Beach in California? That's right, Shauna, uh, Newport Orthopedic Institute. Great. Um, and one of the reasons why we've invited you here is to really help us think about the changes that have happened in private practices. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on with um, academic institutions and with great big, huge hospital systems. But then we've also got this enormous segment of our healthcare that are private practices. And I think you've had to change pretty rapidly. Um, things things are not quite what it was three weeks ago. And so what we've invited you today to do is to help us understand um, how you're responding and how the, the practice management is working in the private practice um, segment. So have you got a set of slides that you wanna share with us? I do. So let me click on those. Are you able to see those? Um, not yet. We've got this great comment that people are, um, we, we have our own little art gallery here. All right. You let me know when you got it. There. Yeah. Are you able to see those? Perfect. Uh, okay, good. That's great. All right, so if you wanna go ahead and um, get started with your presentation, love to hear what you've got for us. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, Shauna, and welcome from Southern California. Uh, and before I get started, I, I also wanna thank Stefano and uh, all of the team that have put this together and worked so hard to do this. It's been really a unifying event uh, for all of us around the world and helped to create a, an even tighter sense of community. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for all of that. So uh, let me go to my first slide. Um, we're in a private practice. And for those of you around the world that are not familiar with that, we are essentially small business owners. And, um, and so we enjoy the benefits uh, and the freedom of being a small business but we also uh, have the risks of being a small business. And uh, at this time, we are dealing with those risks uh, front and center. Right now, as with all businesses across the United States and around the world, uh, we're facing a threat both to our uh, personal health and our financial health as an in industry and an organization in a small business. So we're having to adapt very quickly like, like everyone else around the world. consists of about 30 physicians. We have over 150 employees. In part, we have more employees than a typical private practice because we also run a management services organization to manage other specialty practices. We have multiple offices. We are also um, owners uh, in joint venture with our community hospital, Hogue Memorial Hospital in Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Uh, we, along with our other large groups like the uh, OSI group and other small practices, are owners in Hogue Orthopedic Institute. It's a 70 bed uh, specialty hospital, and then we have multiple surgery centers as well. So, uh, if we look at the talk today, I tried to keep it very basic, and I'm going to cover these four topics, and obviously, Shauna, feel free to jump in and ask questions along the way if you'd like. Uh, but essentially what I wanna focus on today is how you can continue to practice and serve your community and serve your patients in a safe manner, how you, uh, uh, as a surgeon, stop the bleeding, uh, the financial bleeding that's going on in your small business, how you tread water during this time of, of change, and finally, how you prepare to start. So first off, 
I think our number one priority uh, as, as physicians and, and in healthcare is to provide a safe environment for our patients. And so um, we have, uh, because of the shelter in place order in California that occurred on March 19th, we have uh, reduced the number of office visits in our practice dramatically. Essentially, anything that is not urgent or emergent is not coming into the office. And the same is true. So our office visits are probably down by 75% and our uh, surgical volume is probably down by 90%. And so because of that, we are able to reduce the patient visits and spread people out um, uh, and reduce the, the risk of infection. In our office, we have only one entry and exit for the building right now, and we have a checkpoint at that entry. We're doing, doing, doing is, doing is, goes through a questionnaire with regard to their travel history and their health history, and uh, we take their temperature, and, and then as long as their temperature is below 100.0, they can be admitted to the building. Uh, so we're trying very hard to uh, protect everyone, both inside the building and our patients as well. Hey, we really hope, yeah, yeah, when, stop there. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, when, when you're doing that, um, there's already such a, I mean, whenever you go to a place and there's added layers of security, it makes people feel uncomfortable. And our healthcare environments are always meant to feel really safe. And so when we add these layers of things that might feel like you're not welcome until, or we're checking because we have high levels of fear, how are you guys doing this in a way that feels fun and friendly? I mean, you know, when you go to Disney, they have security check lines, they're checking your bags, but somehow or another, they bring the magic into it. What are you guys doing to make that feel not so intimidating and so and and elevate the the, the fear factor? I think that's a great question. And um, what we have tried to do is actually interject into the discussion when we see the patients at the front door that what we are trying to do is to keep everyone as safe as possible. Uh, we know that. We're here to serve you and take care of you during this time for your broken bones or your infection, whatever it is. Uh, but we need to do it in a way that's safe. And our idea is that by providing that level of uh, rigor at the front door, we actually are creating a calmer environment when you come inside the building because mm -hmm. everybody's going to feel safe that, um, that we're taking every step possible. So yes, it is an added step. But we're actually hoping that the psychological effect is that we demonstrate to the patients that we take this seriously. We're here to keep you safe. Yeah. I'm thinking um, where we need to take a, a page out of the playbook is over in the children's hospitals because they're so acutely aware of the anxiety and they make everything, they turn everything into a game. And so I, I think that that's where we need to be. You know, if we're looking for the masters at reducing anxiety, it's definitely over in the pediatric space. Yeah, there's no, no doubt about that. And so I think that part of our job throughout this entire process is, uh, is to be compassionate and to be aware that everyone is stressed, everyone's anxious, and our job is to help calm people. Okay, sorry for the interruption, but thank you. I was gonna say, when you're going through that, that was what was spinning around in my head. Yeah, no, no problem. So um, let's see, uh, so we, I think the only other thing I want to mention is in the hospital environment, we're very used to hand hygiene, you know, gelling in before we go into a room, gelling out uh, when we come out of a room. We have tried to instigate that same level um, of safety here. And so all of our medical assistants and staff are, are doing the same. And then with the exam room itself, we're actually uh, teaching our staff or have taught our staff uh, that we want to terminally clean the room, just like we do an operating room between yeah. surgeries. And so we wipe down every surface, every keyboard, uh, the door handles, everything uh, between patients. And we make sure that people coming in and out of the room are uh, gelling or washing their hands every time they come in and out of the room. And, and uh, that ad adaptation has occurred very quickly uh, in our office. So uh, in, in Moving forward in terms of the business uh, aspect, we've talked about how we're going to keep our, our patients safe and our staff safe. We need to keep our business safe as well. And that means keep it alive. 
And so um, it's important to understand that in private practice, <clears throat> we, don't, we don't have, just like a small business, we don't have a large corporation or a health system behind us that's going to uh, backstop us financially. It's just up to the physicians. And uh, in a typical private practice in the United States in orthopedics, the office overhead runs somewhere between 40 and 50 percent for most practices. And so that means that um, you have a large expense burden uh, on an ongoing basis. And the two major elements of your expense burden are your employees and your rent. And so uh, what we did very quickly, our administrative staff focused on those two key elements right away uh, in terms of the expense side of the equation. And we immediately contacted all of our uh, landlords in the various offices that we have uh, to look at either a freeze on rent for 90 days or a significant rent reduction. And we were fortunate to achieve all of that. Um, at the same time, the more difficult part, I would say, is the human side of, um, of the employees. And that's a very challenging aspect for uh, the physicians and the administrative staff to have to uh, reduce the number of employees that are currently working with us. We chose as a group to furlough our staff rather than actually lay them off. And I think it's important for doctors who haven't come to this step yet to understand the difference. If you furlough your staff, you uh, as an organization continue to pay their health benefits and, and their benefits. However, they are now able to um, apply for and collect unemployment. In California, that means that they should be able to collect approximately 60 cents on the dollar for what they were being paid. So it's not perfect by any means, but if we can maintain their uh, health benefits during this time, and then the state can help to pick up um, a portion of their salary, uh, we hope that that'll be enough to help see people through. In addition, uh, our employees have a paid time off bank that they can use. And then there are rules around uh, sick leave as well that you can uh, look at drawing down some income from that. So there are several things that the Department of Labor has put in place. And at the end of my talk, I've got a nice um, link for people that will give you a lot of information on the basics of that. From the, from the revenue side of the equation, the first thing that we did was that we stopped um, for all the partners, all the physicians in the group, we are not going to be drawing a salary, a bonus, any sort of distribution uh, for at least two months and possibly longer in an effort to preserve cash. Uh, our administrative staff has also accepted a reduction in their pay uh, and uh, they have withheld um, the payment of their bonuses for last year until we get back on track in terms of our our finances. Um, and we're doing all of this as a way to remain open and to be able to continue to serve our community and to keep a business that we can bring all of our employees back to when uh, when we get through all of this. You know, Jamie, when you were mentioning um, this, I I'm reminded of Simon Sinek's work about, you know, his, his book that he wrote, Leaders Eat Last. And we heard yesterday from the some of our, our friends and colleagues in New York how important it is for leadership to be physically and vis visually present. And the way you've described this, this is not any one group of the team disproportionately impacted. It is a shared experience of we're coming together as a team to address this. And one of the, a couple of the practices that I've spoken with, some of the things that they've done is with their staff, they've really turned this inward to say, okay, all of those things that we never had time to do as far as our internal work, our internal practices, how we think about our relationships with our vendors, our website presence, our compliance, that they've taken them from a clinical role and they've put them in more to an administrative role. Have you um, been looking at that or how is that, is that something that's working for you guys or you're considering? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually a perfect segue to my next slide <laughs> where uh, we did so, not rehearse this we're just <laughs> so uh, we you know we have gone through the what I'll say the triage phase right now as a surgeon uh, of trying to to stem the the bleeding and and stabilize things by uh, going through our first uh, 
furlough and that's a difficult thing. But then we, we need to keep doing things uh, once we reach the next phase, which I'm calling treading water at this point. Um, I, I had a couple of my boys played water polo, so I'm very familiar with, uh, with that. But, um, you know, we need to keep the business going and we need to come up with creative ways to do that during this time. So we, as you, as you mentioned, Shauna, we have relative time on our hands right now that we didn't have previously. And so this is, for all of you who are in private practice, this is a great time to sit down and reflect on your business and your business model. And um, I think that we're seeing a, and you've had speakers earlier on today uh, talking about telemedicine and telehealth. I think that this is going to be a permanent change in how we deliver care. We've been talking around this at the edges for years. Um, I've been fortunate to be going up to DocSF uh, since inception and looking at all these technologies. And this has become a catalyst for us to uh, adopt and adapt our practices to these technologies now and look at ways that we can start to change. So I would use the, the relative amount of time on our hands to, uh, to make these changes right now and to actually look into every single aspect of your practice and ask the question, how can you do this more efficiently? One of the things that, um, that Joe Bosco touched on yesterday from the Academy is that this is probably a moment where you're going to start to see some uh, both horizontal and vertical consolidation across the healthcare delivery industry. In the private practice world, that likely means that practices that were previously possibly considering coming together will now yeah. have a, an impetus to do that and to come together. With People telehealth, who are once competitors are now going to become collaborators. Yes, exactly yeah. right. And and mm -hmm. I think we're all looking at. Uh, if telehealth really becomes as uh, profound as we think it will be, um, we will not need as much real estate as we currently have taken down. And that means that we can bring groups together and start to share some of the real estate footprint that we have um, in, our, in our companies. And so there are lots of uh, opportunities in this crisis that we need to, to focus on. Obviously, we need to continue during this time of treading water to look at how we can reduce costs and reduce our burn rate as an organization. But we also need to be thinking forward, uh, given that we have the, the time on our hands. And uh, I think that one of the keys throughout this entire process is communicating. Obviously, that's what Stefano had in mind when he put this together. But we need to be communicating and committing ourselves to communicating both with our, our patients and our staff, uh, and quite frankly, with others in the community that are also struggling. You know, we're a resource uh, as physicians for our community, and so we need to be looking at what can we be doing to help our hospitals and our clinics or, um, in our community during this time. And I, I think that'll make everybody stronger as we move forward. Well, to, to amplify so, that, we have heard there's not been a single presentation and 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 beyond this this conference that we're putting together, where that theme of communication hasn't come up. And what's been very key is that not only who communicates, um, I mean that's been a big piece. Who's doing the communicating? Is it a trusted source? Is it consistent and reliable? Is it um, instilling, uh, is it honest? You know, it might be like, we don't have the answer, but that's an honest answer. And so it is, you know, communicating, being consistent, being reliable, and making sure that all those people who are communicating are communicating the same message. So I, I think that you would probably, I mean, what you've said, I, I'm wondering, is, is there something you've learned from that? Do you agree with that? Is there something you want to add to that? I, I absolutely agree with that, Shauna. I think that um, we need to, and we've worked on this within our group, uh, which is to make sure that we are communicating consistently. And so the way we have approached this both in our group um, and then also at the hospital, I'm on the leadership side at the hospital, is to make sure that we have a single source of communication going out to the medical staff and to the um, uh, all of the staff, the, the working staff, the nurses and medical assistants and everyone else. Um, and that prior to that source of uh, communication going out, we all um, huddle twice a week on the phone 
and we uh, talk through the various issues, uh, both from a clinical standpoint in terms of we get our infectious disease expert on the phone and we look at the trending data throughout Orange County and Southern California and then within our hospitals. And we uh, apply that trending data to our communique within our hospital. It also helps within our group because one of the next things we need to be doing is looking at based on the trending at where and when we flatten the curve what does that mean in terms of starting back up operations? And, and that's so one of the that's, that's one of the comments and the questions that's coming up is um, thinking about uh, as we reinitiate and reengage. So it sounds like you're using this communication and this instant data to really inform a an evolving situation. That's yeah, that's right. Uh, we like I said, we talk. We have two standing calls um, every week. Uh, that goes through the leadership, both on the hospital side and the, and the clinic side, our orthopedic institute. And um, in those calls, we have a variety of topics, but we are looking at real-time data. We take the, um, the data from the hospital from the midnight prior to our call, and that becomes the basis of our discussion and decision-making in terms of our planning. And so we're, we're trying to be as current as possible uh, with our information. All right, I'll let you get back so, to your slides. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. So again, you, uh, without a prompt, you gave me a, a perfect segue to my, you know, my last topic here. That's what here. good and host is supposed to do. Yeah, you did a great job. So uh, that's, you know, we talked just, uh, just a moment ago about using this downtime uh, to start thinking creatively and to really assess your business of your private practice and your uh, how you're taking care of people in a clinical fashion, you need to start thinking about um, what you're going to do when you start back up. And I touched on this previously, but mm -hmm. are you going to now practice the same way you did before? Or are you going to start to incorporate some of the technologies mm -hmm. that you've heard about in this meeting? Um, I uh, was able to give a, a cameo appearance yesterday during the uh, discussion by Todd Johnson on, on uh, Health Loop. We've been using that, uh, for example, extensively during, not only during this crisis, but um, during the last five years. And that's a great tool that you can incorporate that actually does reduce the, uh, the phone and communication burden in your office. Um, at the same time, telehealth is going to definitely reduce the number of office visits and, and streamline uh, how we perform this. Um, if Medicare uh, maintains the changes that it is currently made to the payment model for telehealth, it is likely that the private insurers will have to follow that. Uh, so currently in our practice, we have all different types of payer models that we work with, both Medicare, uh, private insurance, we work with full risk contracts, we work with HMO contracts. So we bundle payment, we, we do all the different stuff. And I anticipate that we're gonna see some consolidation around the use of technology and the realization by the payers that everyone's better off if we can start to, to use these technologies. And in order to make that happen, we're going to have to see uh, payers pay us the same way when we use uh, telehealth as, as if we're having a physical visit, which CMS has now agreed to. And I think that's a great change that's been made. Um, I think also you're going to need to look at your employees and whether or not they need to be on site. Currently, we've got a large portion of our uh, staff that's working from home. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to look at many of the different tasks that you use in your office and determine whether those tasks can be performed remotely and just as productively. Again, these are things that we've been doing for several years, but now it's really paying dividends to have, uh, you know, staff that are working from home and able to continue to do so without missing a beat. And I think that we will incorporate that more and more in our practices across the United States uh, as we go forward. So I, I think that we need to stay positive, not only for our staff and for ourselves, but for our patients as well. I think it's important to, to send that emotional message to them that um, we're here, we're gonna help take care of you, things are gonna be okay, we're gonna come out the other end of this. Everyone asks the same question 
50 times a day, which is when, when will this change? When will this be over? And the honest answer is the virus has its own yeah. timetable. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, we can watch the trends and then we can start to change our practices to minimize the risk of infection. And that's what we're doing. So, so finally, I just wanted to uh, encourage everyone to take a screenshot. These two, I've, I've combed through quite a few different websites to look for the most concise and simple sites. The top site is one with regard to all of the various labor laws, uh, looking at furlough versus layoff, paid time off, all of the laws. And I would um, make sure that you recognize that these are state dependent. They are not necessarily national. Mm -hmm. And so you need to look at what's going on in your individual state and um, and then you can go from there. And then the other resource is, I think, a very good resource with regard to the Small Business Business Association and the loan process um, that is out there for doctors that are in private practice. Um, this applies to, and you heard about this yesterday from the Academy, yeah. this applies to um, groups that are smaller than 500. And so the vast majority of practices in the United States are smaller than 500. Employees. Yeah. yeah. And the, the Academy had a lot of really great um, resources and help on that. And and that actually, there was um, a question in here from Lou Sean. He wanted to know if, and maybe you know something about this, is there an interest-free loan program that can be initiated to get your valuable staff through a personal cash crunch? Um, I mean, what I, you go ahead and answer and I'll tell you what I've seen. Uh, so with regard to the legislation that just occurred, okay. um, the answer is I am not aware of an interest. There is a six month interest free loan that you get from the Small Business Association if you qualify for um, for the loan. And I, I can just kind of run through that loan very quickly if you'd like. Yes, um, please. Mm -hmm. that, that loan is a fixed rate, a 4% fixed rate loan. Um, there's no prepayment penalty and you get six months of interest only on that loan. If, again, as I said previously, if you have fewer than 500 employees, you would be eligible for that. And the phrase that they are using to qualify is that your business has to be substantially affected by COVID-19. So you need to be able to put together um, the bullet points that demonstrate how you've had to change your business uh, during this crisis in order to qualify for the loan. The I think that's one loan. simple sentence, one simple sentence. We had to cancel all our elective surgeries. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we're down 90% uh, in yeah. terms of our, our surgical volume and 75% yeah. in terms of our clinic volume. So that, that pretty much says it in a nutshell. I don't think that this is a, a hurdle that's going to be difficult for most of our orthopedic practices. Yeah. No, I think I, I honestly feel everyone uh, in private practice should be able to qualify for this yeah. loan. Mm -hmm. It's a 10-year loan. Um, the amount of the loan is 2.5, two and a half times the average cost of your payroll uh, that was over the past 12 months up to $10 million. So the maximum amount of loan that you can take mm -hmm. down is $10 million. You can use the loan for your payroll, for your employed, uh, employee salaries, mortgage, rent, utilities. And so this is the I, I think the lion's share of what you're going to need it for in private practice. And then finally, a key element of this is the forgiveness. And uh, they will allow up to eight weeks of forgiveness on this loan uh, in terms of the expenses, provided you can document the expenses for an eight week period. So you may be able to have that portion of the loan forgiven altogether which is amazing and, and um, very needed at this point in time for all the small businesses across the United States, not just private practice in medicine. Right. You know, and one of the things that you'd mentioned about um, the time frame, because everybody the, operating in a situation, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the phrase, a, a VUCA environment. Um, it's a military term, um, V-U-C-A, um, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, the military used that an awful lot when, you know, post 9-11 to be able to, to try to address that. And actually, when we think about 
uh, a VUCA environment, one of my former professors, um, he was talk about talk about talk about uh, talking about it, <laughs> and said VUCA as a leader, we need to think about this as vision, understanding, clarity, and um, accountability. You know, and and I actually, you know, I'm thinking about that as really as agility. You know, we need to be able yeah. to, to be very agile in all of this. So, you know, there's the VUCA environment, which we are clearly in. But as leaders, how do we apply the, the vision and the clarity and the accountability? Um, and I, I think another C could be confidence. And when we right. talk about, you know, we're, we're on the timeline of the virus. But as individuals, we have a lot of say and a lot of actions that we can take. I mean, we just start out with the personal hand hygiene, the, the physical distancing, um, and in the physical distancing, we need to have that message of staying in communication and connected through the tools that we have. And right. I think, I think you know, your your description of how do we create the calm not only for our patients but also for our staff and our teams, and and knowing that we've been through hard things before, we have. Right. Yeah, I, I think those are great points. Um, I think as a as as physician leaders across the United States. Projecting calm is something that um, is critical. And again, as surgeons, this is something that ideally you do in the operating room under stressful circumstances. You're masters. Uh, everyone, masters well, projecting calm. <laughs> I, I think that uh, many of us have had practice in this over the mm -hmm. years where you'll be in the middle of an operation and something will happen that is unanticipated and potentially life-threatening for the patient. And the worst thing you can do as a surgeon is to start screaming and running around the operating room. Uh, the best thing you can do for your team. Can I have you say that again, just so that all of the the all of the staff who work with surgeons to remind us again what? <laughs> what <laughs> I will I will uh, guarantee that there are some surgeons who scream and run around the operating room, but I I will tell you that the the best um, in those situations are the surgeons that can literally put a lap into the wound, hold, hold their hand on the bleeding vessel and take a deep breath and uh, just yeah. count to three, take a deep breath, calm yourself, and then start to deal with the uh, situation at hand. Yeah. And so I think we have to do the same thing here. And that's why, uh, quite frankly, in my slides, I kind of went at it like a triage surgeon where um, you need to take that deep breath, hold your hand on the bleeding vessel and recognize that uh, things are only going to get worse if you panic as the surgeon. Things are going to get better if you stay calm. You're going to project calm to your team. Everybody's going to work better uh, in a in a triage situation. And so, yeah. I think I think throughout the office uh, we need to be doing the same. We need to be uh, demonstrating that it's going to be okay. And that's part of our job as as physicians is to be able to calm people. I was just going to say in in my. Um ED and trauma experience, it's always take your own pulse first, take a deep right. breath, and then you can you can help others be calm. So we need to wrap this up. There's one question that I think um, is is a is a, an important one to answer as we come out on the other side of this, and we are, um, and in part because of leaders like you, Jamie, I really appreciate um, well, you're helping you. us walk through very detailed steps on this because that's what we need is. High concept is really great. And in this moment, we need the details. That That's where all of this lies. Right. So what challenges are you anticipating in meeting the pent up demand so that as we think about um, reengaging and bringing things back to a, I won't say, you know, a lot of people are using the word the new normal, but um, let's think about the new optimal. You know, when we, when yeah. we're back up and running and there are a lot of people who have not been seen, who need to be seen, what steps do you see in um, reinitiation uh, to mitigate some of the challenges where people have, have been waiting a long period of time? So it's interesting you should uh, once again ask the right question. Uh, we had a meeting about that this morning, actually, and we talked about um, the startup and what would be involved in that in terms of pent-up demand. We feel that it's important from our our practice standpoint that the office look at, um, we have we have always had expanded office hours, evening hours and things like that. I think we're going to look at 
formally going to two separate shifts um, and starting early in the morning, going later into the evening. Um, if we are able to use telehealth effectively, that should free up a lot of our medical staff in order to uh, accommodate and populate two separate shifts. In terms of our surgical volume, we have already uh, been preparing the staff, even the staff that has been furloughed for the for the fact that we will be coming back and when we do be ready for working six and seven days a week and long hours. And so we're, we're trying to do is to send two separate messages. The first message obviously is to give people hope and say, we are coming back and you better be ready. I and mean, I think that sends a fundamentally positive message to the staff when we do that. And then the second message is, um, enjoy the time you have right now. Rest because, up because we're that's gonna right. be in a sprint marathon when we get going again. Be, when, when we get started, we don't wanna hear anybody complaining uh, at that point about how tired they are. We're all gonna be working hard and we're gonna make up for the time that we've uh, had right now. So, well, this has been just fantastic. And again, I want to thank all of our very engaged audience for joining us here at COVID-19, the orthopedic response. And um, I want to thank the American Academy of Surgeons who have been joining us in convening this global set of problem solvers and solution finders. And thank you for being a lead in all of that, Jamie. And stay safe, wash your hands, Thanks. get extra rest, and be right. the leader that we need. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Shauna. Bye-bye.